um, well, it's three of one. We can start with introductions, I suppose, so that it's, you know, so that we can have a lot of time for the discussion of the chapter. Um, so, hello everyone again, my name is Gabby, um, and I'm gonna be leading the cohort, this third cohort for this book, the, uh, the uh, base rules book, um, in which we are going to be just well, reading a chapter, a different chapter from this book um, each week, unless it's, um, I don't know, um, Thanksgiving or, well, Thanksgiving is always on Thursday. So um, unless it's like a big thing, I don't know, Christmas or something like that, right? So then we, won't, we wouldn't be uh, meeting for that week. And we can discuss those things in the, um, in the Slack in the channel, in, 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 in uh, the R4DS Slack. Um, and we can say like, listen, this chapter was too large. We need to um, discuss it uh, in two weeks because it was just too much content or something like that. We can, we can uh, make those adjustments because we are, I mean, it's, it's for us, right? For our learning. So if, if because, some of those chapters are just huge. Some of those analyses are just so big that one hour is just not enough. So, um, just, so just have that in mind or bear that in mind. Um, the other thing that um, we have to remember always is that these um, sessions are gonna be recorded always and they're gonna be uploaded to the um, R4DS channel, uh, YouTube channel. So they're gonna be available there. In case, for example, you cannot join this week for whatever reason, you can always go back and watch those. And you can always, uh, you can also watch um, each chapter or the discussion for each chapter from the other cohorts. Those are just, uh, those are gonna be there and I'm gonna put the link um, on the chat. And the chat is also going to be recorded and it will be shared afterwards. So um, I think it's like a few minutes after our session is done, um, then John puts it in, in the Slack channel and then um, not just link to the video, but um, like the transcript of, of our um, chat here, the log, the chat log, if you will. Um, so then, yeah, and then just let me share this screen before I let you guys talk a little bit. Um, so I think you're seeing um, the Slack channel, right? So, or the Slack, um, yeah, the Slack channel. So we can put here also other types of resources. So for example, um, oh, I found this for chapter one and this video explains things very well or something. We can post those things here and just say for cohort three, um, I found this example and, you know, we can discuss this this week or this clarifies some of the points that we were making in last week's um, discussion or something like that, right? Like the space is for us to keep learning um, asynchronous, I suppose, right? After um, the discussion is over. And remember that you can also um, find um, these links here. So for example, um, this is the link to the GitHub repository where you can find a lot of the resources, like for example, the book, um, the code for most of this analysis too, the data, most of those things are gonna be um, in this GitHub repository. Then we also have um, a link to the book in case you for some reason forgot it or whatever, There's all, it's, it's always linked. The shared notes, which is um, like, uh, an excerpt from the book that we build and that I am going to be using today and each of us are gonna be using them in coming um, discussions for each one of the chapters, which are just excerpts, right? It's not gonna be the book, it's just gonna be like little snippets of the book so that we can all um, uh, sort of have something on the screen to, to sort of guide us, right? And then we have this, this link for the signups, I'm going to click it so that you can see it. If you go to cohort three, you're going to uh, be linked to a, I don't know if you can see it, I hope you can. Um, so it's a link to, um, to a Google spreadsheet where you can sign up 
for which chapters you would like to present. And uh, it, it, it includes the expected date and the, um, the name of the chapter. And in case we don't have a meeting, we can also put it there in case it's like, like I said, it's Christmas or it's like, I don't know, something, right? Um, we can always put it there. Um, so for today, I wrote down my name and then um, each one can sign up whenever they want. Uh, the, the idea is that even if I'm leading this cohort, I'm not supposed to be presenting each week because it's, it's, it's like, it's a community, right? A learning community. All of us are learning uh, together. So that's, so that's basically the, the, the idea behind this. So what I'm gonna do now, if I can find, stop sharing, there you go. Um, so now I'm gonna, now that I have all the admin stuff out of the way, um, we can go and introduce, everyone can introduce themselves and sort of let us know um, where they are in their Bayesian journey. Like, are you, oh yeah, I know this by heart or I've never heard of this before, but I'm interested or it doesn't matter because you don't have to be an expert, right? So if you could please share a little bit of your experience. I can go first. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm like, I don't really know much about Bayesian statistics, but I work in a group where heaps of them do it. I, then when they talk about, you know, their projects, I have no idea what they're talking about for the most part. Um, and I've previously done some like um, models with BRMS, but really treating it like another, you know, like just using LME4 sort of thing. Like I'm just using like mixed models and not really thinking too hard about priors. So um, I'm looking to learn a bit more about it so I can do it, do it properly. I can go next. Hi, I'm Diana. I'm a PhD candidate at UC Davis. And for one of my chapters, I was using Bayesian modeling, because that's a lot of what my lab does. And I actually like it more than frequent tests because it's kind of more intuitive. Um, and yeah, so I have like practice in it, but if you if you put like an undergrad in front of me and we're like explain Bayesian sets, I'd be like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> So I want to kind of be able to explain it better. Okay, All right. Uh, yeah, go, go. Okay. I'm Oluwa Femi, my name. I'm, I'm from Nigeria. Though I've not uh, done much uh, with the variation model, though I did a little bit about, I touched a little bit about the variation model when I was doing my MSc at the University of Ibadan here in Nigeria. So, but I am hoping that this cohort, I am going to still learn more about uh, the variation approach because I've heard that uh, the variation modeling is very uh, superior. It's, uh, it's, very, it's very robust uh, as to compared uh, to the frequencies approach. Though so I hope that this cohort, I am going to uh, learn more about uh, variation modeling. All right, all right. Thank you, Laura Femi. Um, okay, so Mary says that she's in a different time zone and that uh, I suppose she cannot talk because maybe it's maybe it's nighttime or something. Oh, she's also from Nigeria. Okay. Um, she's a beginner with little or no knowledge of this subject, um, except basic statistics, and would want to advance deeper to use it for her plant breeding work on rice and cereals. Okay, Cote d'Ivoire, I think it's called. Forgive me, my French is terrible. <laughs> I can barely speak English here, you guys. Okay. Um, all right, all right. Thank you, Mary. Um, so I guess that's all of us. Um, like I said, I'm Gabby, and I my experience with Bayesian analysis is that I I consider myself a beginner. I am not really advanced or anything, but I have read some books and I'm, I'm if if a beginner beginner like is a zero then I, I would consider myself a two 
two, three, or something like that. Some of my favorite books are this one by, I don't know if you can see it, by um, uh, Hobbes and Houghton. I always forget the first one. Um, this is brilliant, you guys. This is beautiful, um, but it doesn't help a lot with coding. It's it's more like a, for the theory behind it. And this one, oh my God, this explains it like like you're a five year old and you don't understand what um, what anything is, you know. So I, I that's why I like this book a lot. And now we have this other one, which is gonna be great because then um, the more we keep reading, at least that's in my experience, right? Learning is like layers. So the more we read about something, the more we we're gonna learn about it. Um, so with that being said, um, let's let's start. Let's 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 begin. So the idea is that you guys um, read the chapter beforehand before coming to these sessions. Um, let me see, Mary. You put, you put a question here. You say, um, could I get the full details of? these books, especially on theoretical knowledge to help me. Oh yeah, so the books that I'm mentioning, they are actually, um, there are some resources to list that I will show you right now where in the book that we're reading, it's in the preface somewhere, but the ones that I'm uh, sharing with you um, are, one of them is called um, Bayesian Models. I'm gonna put it down in the chat, Bayesian Models. A statistical primer for ecologists. Because I'm an ecologist, forgive me. I'm a carnivore ecologist, allegedly. <laughs> uh, and the authors are Hobbes and Houghton. So that's the first book. And the other one is called Doing Bayesian Data Analysis, a tutorial with R. Jax and Stan, and it's by John Krushki, and I always, okay, there we go. Those are the two books, and this one too, because this one is, um, it's really good in the sense that it explains things very, very easily, like very digested. It's, it's not, because I hate it when some books just have like so much, I don't know, verbiage or whatever. Um, okay, so the other thing, let me just share my screen. Um, chapter one, I think it's this one. Mm, it's this one, okay. Share. Okay, so here, if we go to the book, this is the link to the book. You can buy it if you want, but you don't have to because clearly we have, we have it freely available. Um, so when you go to, I think it's not here. No, I don't remember exactly where it is, but I will link it in the, in the Slack. There are other resources. Oh, it's in the notes. Oh, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot. Um, you share, so it's gonna be here. Um, is it here? Yeah, resources mentioned. So um, these are other resources and they're gonna be linked in the, um, in the notes. If you go to Slack, one of the um, links that I told you that it's on the top part of the, um, of the screen where it says uh, notes, uh, let me see what it, what it says. It says shared notes. So this is what I'm reading right now. So the part where it says 1.9 resources mentioned, you're going to find links to other books and to other, um, like a podcast. There's another one too, actually, that I can link and more resources that you can um, use to advance your knowledge in the Bayesian journey, I suppose. Um, we're going to start with the first part. I hope everyone can see this. Um, if for whatever reason my screen is not correctly being shared or whatever, please just let me know. Um, I can't do two things at the same time, so it's better if you just talk to me instead of letting me um, sending me things through the chat because 
I'm not really monitoring the chat so much. <laughs> so if you unmute yourself and you say, I can understand that, or can you repeat that or whatever, then I'll be more than happy to do so. So let's start. Um, so going through the first chapter, they start by stating and each chapter is gonna do exactly the same. So I'm reading here again, once again, so that you can find it. Uh, the book notes that you can find on the Slack channel uh, that are linked, where it says shared notes. That's exactly um, what I'm using here and what we were gonna use each week, right? So that you know, you can have access to this information too. So the first chapter starts, and like I mentioned, every chapter starts with the learning objectives, which are gonna guide us through what we're gonna learn in, in that chapter and what we have to focus ourselves on for that chapter. So the first one uh, is gonna help us learn how to think like a Bayesian, or at least I guess, learn how Bayesian statisticians think as opposed to frequencists. Then we're going to explore the foundations of a Bayesian data analysis and how they contrast with the frequentist alternative. Because I think most of us are used to a frequentist um, approach, right? Where we estimate means, we have data already collected or we are collecting data and then we are estimating a mean, a median, a standard deviation, um, confidence intervals. And that's what we're, you, I, I think since school, right? We're used to working like that. Bayesian thinking or a Bayesian approach is different from that. So that's what chapter one um, sort of tries to explain. And obviously learn a little bit about the history of the Bayesian philosophy, which is uh, rather crazy, I think, uh, but um, let's go through it. So let's start. So um, every time you see one of these diagrams, it's this is super cool because you can actually make them in R. And to do so, you use this package called diagram R. And this is an example. This is like the code that they used to construct or to build or to create this, um, this diagram. So it's pretty cool. Um, it's a pretty cool package so that I recommend you guys to explore it. And I'm sure they have like a vignette and a, a lot of resources on how, to, um, on how to use it. So basically this is like, um, this is the, the, the core to understand Bayesian analysis. So this is called the Bayesian knowledge building diagram. That's what the, what, what the authors call it. And it's basically how you use not just data, like we're used to in frequency analysis, right? We have a population, we sample from that population. So that's our data. And then we make conclusions or inferences from, uh, from that data from the sample, right? From the data that we collected uh, using this sample to say something about the population. That's the frequentist way of doing things. But here, we not just have data that we have collected, we also have a prior. We have prior information. How we're gonna code that, that comes later. So right now, just don't bother too much on trying to understand that. But it's this prior, information in combination with the data that we collected that we are going to inform uh, the model to build the posterior. And this is gonna be, um, this is like the core of the analysis. So in Bayesian analysis, the prior is going to represent what you know, the information that you have previously before seeing the data. The data is the data, right? And then the posterior is going to represent then what you now know, having seen the data and contrasting it with your prior information. So then this is something that keeps being repeated, repeated and over, over and over and over again. So you can update your posterior because then you collect new data and then you say, oh, well, I have I had reached this conclusion, but now that I collected more data, I'm gonna update my posterior and reach a different conclusion or reach a new conclusion or 
say something um, that I have more data, right? I'm informing my posterior more with this new data that I'm collecting. So both Bayesian and frequencies share a common goal, which is going to be to learn from data about the world around us. Both use data to fit models and make predictions and evaluate hypotheses. The difference is, the difference is this, this, this prior information that we're taking into account, not just the data, to then make a, make a conclusion or make like, a, like, a, like an um, informed, inference, if you will, right? So our new knowledge, if we call the posterior our new knowledge, is being informed by the prior information that we had and the data that we collected. And then that is going to give us our updated information. And then we feed more data and we update our knowledge of these things and then on and on and on. Um, okay, so um, then there was like a quiz. I don't know if you guys did this quiz. Um, I did it actually a few months ago when I sort of started reading the book and I got a different score than the one that I have now. I don't know if, you, if any of you want to share what score you got here. If you guys did the quiz. If not, I can give you like a few minutes to do the quiz. Let me see if I can. Yeah, I got a bit of both when I did it. I yeah, what no? Oh, yeah, you were in the middle. So that was me a few months ago, but now I got a nine, which puts me more towards Bayesian. <laughs> so I am updating my knowledge, right? <laughs> the others, do you want to share what um, what number you got? I got a nine. A nine, just like me? Oh, Diana, yeah. that's so cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so neither one of them is right or wrong, right? It's, um, it's just ways of thinking. I suppose the ideal is to be in the middle, right? To have a score of six to eight. I, had a, I think I have a seven or an eight before. Um, so that's the idea, right? Because then you need, you know when to apply each one or sort of when to use it, right? But some people just say, no, no, I'm Bayesian and that's it. And some people just say, I don't wanna know anything about that. So I'm just a frequentist, which is fine either way, right? Okay, let's continue. So the idea is that um, through these questions that we saw in this quiz, we can sort of understand the difference in the way frequentists and Bayesians think and the way they work with probability and the way they see um, uh, probability and the way they state hypotheses, I suppose. So for example, interpreting probability, this is, this is big, right? Because both are gonna work with probabilities, but for Bayesian philosophy, the idea is that probability means the relative plausibility of an event, whereas for a frequentist, a probability is more like the long run relative frequency of a repeatable event. And that's, you can see that throughout all of the examples. So for a Bayesian statistician, when they are um, working with hypotheses and they are um, trying to make inferences uh, based on the models and all of that that they have, um, they're going to say something like, in light of the observed data, what's the chance that the hypothesis is correct? Whereas a frequentist, when working with hypotheses, they're gonna say, if in fact this hypothesis is true or is correct, what's the chance that I would have observed this result or even more extreme data. And if you remember um, from your previous statistic, statistic classes, frequencies usually work with um, uh, error type error one, type error two, right? What's the probability of you having had um, a false positive or a, or a false negative result? 
So that's ingrained in frequencies, right? So I'm gonna repeat it again so that you guys can hear it again. So Bayesian um, statistician or the Bayesian philosopher is going to see hypotheses as something like this. In light of the observed data, what's the chance that the hypothesis is correct, right? So they are using the data that they're collecting. They're saying, based on the data that I have here, what is the probability or what is the possibility that what I'm, what I, the hypothesis that I'm stating is correct? Whereas a frequentist will say, if in fact the hypothesis is correct or is true, what's the chance I would have observed this or even more extreme data? So it's a matter of repeating samples, right? That's, that's frequentist. Um, so if we go to, um, Oh, this is not the first one, I think. Let's stay here then. So the first example was with the coin. I don't know if you guys remember that example. I can do a new share and put the book. Share. Okay, so if we go, let's see that example. So that first example said, when flipping a fur coin, we say that the probability, I'm going to, Make this a little maybe less. Um, cleanse yourself here. When flipping a fur coin, we say that the probability of flipping heads is 0.5. How do you interpret this probability? So a frequentist would say if we repeat this experiment or if we repeat this thing that we're doing, right? This event, the flipping coin experiment, if you will. If we repeat it over and over again, roughly half of these flips will be had because we have a 0.5 probability of obtaining a, a, a heads or tails, right? Of obtaining either one of these results. Whereas a Bayesian analysis would say, this is like what the frequencies would say, would say heads and tails are equally pos possible are equally likely to happen because I have a prior knowledge of saying, well, I'm, I, I, I don't know anything about this coin other than the fact that it's a fair coin. And then when I, when I see the data, let's say I flip the coin and I get a, uh, a head and I'm gonna say, oh, because the probability, the prior information that I have is that it's a fair coin, then it makes sense, right? That I'm gonna get heads 50% of the time, or the, the more, uh, let's say, whenever I do this experiment, I'm gonna get either one. Not that I'm gonna get more heads or more tails. It's I'm gonna get either one because both are equally plausible. So that's the way of interpreting the first example. Anyone has any comments or any questions about this first one? So um, let me just put the slack here. Okay. The second example was um, regarding uh, an election, right? So let's say there's an election coming up and candidate A has the 0.9% probability, not the point percent probability, has a probability of 0.9 of winning. How do you interpret this probability? So a frequentist would say that um, an extreme frequentist, I suppose, could say that we have a probability of either one or zero because there's only one time that the, the elections are gonna happen. So he either wins or loses, that's it. But in reality, um, the fact that frequencies are working with repeated sampling, right? So we're sampling from a population. So that means that uh, the, the conception of the concepts here in frequentists means that we have to um, repeat this experiment over and over again to understand that probability, right? So that's how you would interpret it. If we observe the election over and over, let's say we were going to repeat the election, which is impossible to do, right? Over and over, 
candidate A will win roughly 90% of the time. We would get him um, elected 90% of the time, nine out of 10 times he would be elected. Whereas when we are approaching this problem with a Bayesian framework or a Bayesian philosophy, we would say candidate A is much more likely to win than to lose. So we have the prior information and then we see the data and then that's how we create this conclusion, right? Our posterior is this one. That is gonna be more likely for one of them to win or to lose. Okay, and if we go to the third one, which is the one that we have in our notes. Where are my notes? I think it's this uh, share. Okay. Let me zoom in here. So this third one, is with the artificial sweeteners. And I have a video for you. If you guys go to, um, let me see if I can do a new share here. I don't know if you guys have seen, let me wait, new share. Yeah, I think you're, you're seeing it, right? Let me just make sure. Okay, so I don't know if you have seen this on YouTube or on um, TikTok. It's really funny because he's, this Italian man is married to an American woman and he claims that he can say the origin of the wine. If, it's, if it comes from France, if it comes from Italy, if it comes from anywhere, he will say 100% accurately the origin of the wine every time. And they film these videos because it's super funny. And that's the flag of the US, right? That's the Italian flag, so he's correct. That's the American flag again. <laughs> so that's what he said. He doesn't like French wine, which I think is a travesty. French wine is really good, but you know, it's just to illustrate another form of seeing this other example that we were seeing with the artificial sweeteners, right? So his claim is that he can, so that's a prior, right? He's claiming that he can 10 out of 10 times say the origin of the wine correctly which is exactly what um, Kavya claims was, that she can distinguish between natural and artificial sweeteners. I think it was 10 out of 10 times. I, I don't remember, what did it say? Let's see. Uh, oh, she doesn't say, she just says, uh, based on 10 sweetener samples, uh, she correctly identifies each one. So she, she's, that's the data that we have. The other one is claiming to have a, a, a 10 out of 10 prediction. Um, so yeah, so here, this is another example, right? Of how you can see these things and how you can, um, based on prior information, uh, how you would um, answer or approach this probability problem. The frequentist approach will discard prior knowledge and would say it is harder to predict a coin flip or yes, that your palate is super sensitive to the origin of the wine or the source of the sweetener. And they will just say, no, whatever you thought prior to this, we don't care. The data is this, probability of success is 0.5, is 0.3, is 0.4. Whereas the Bayesian will update the information, the conclusion, the inference based on the prior knowledge and the data. So the question that I'm asking you now is, I don't know if you guys um, read this in the, in the chapter and if you would like to discuss this, because this is like the core 
the core of the analysis that we're going to be doing later, obviously with code and all of that, but the models are doing a balance between the prior and the data. Do you remember what the book said about this, about how we can balance prior and data? And you talked about like the strength of the data and the and how confident you are in the prior, right? So if you have more data than you would you'd lean towards the uh, what you observed more than otherwise. Exactly. So based on the strength of each one of them, based on the strength of the prior or the data, that's what it's going to end up informing the posterior more, right? So the strength of each one. Is, is, is super important. So that's the balance between the prior and the data is, the, is determined by the relative strength of each one. Whichever has more strength is going to contribute more to that posterior. When we have little data, for example, that's gonna be very weak strength, right? It's because we only have very few data points. We didn't collect a lot of data, we can still do a Bayesian model with that. We don't need 10,000 samples like with frequencies, right? That's no issue with Bayesian modeling. It's just that the data is going to inform the posterior very little because the strength of the data is going to be very low, very weak, very, it's not going to be as strong as the prior. So when we have little data, our posterior can draw more information from the prior. And then as we keep collecting data, the prior will eventually lose its, lose its, inform, uh, lose its influence on the posterior. But it's that updating with more and more data that our model is going to be eventually informed more from the data than the prior. When we have very little data, the prior is like, hear me this is what i'm saying so the posterior is going to say well yeah i'm going to hear the prior more because it has more strength more it's more loud if you will so so that's like um that's the core if you guys just um did someone say anything mary you had a question Okay. Okay. No, I think it was just um okay. Let's see. Is it this one? Yeah. Okay. So um in thinking like a Bayesian, like the final part of this is asking a question. What's the chance um when we go because they were asked, they were saying something about the this this diagnosis that we have from having this very rare disease that apparently we tested positive for it. So how would Bayesians and frequencies would approach this? Um, so a, a frequencies would say what. What's the chance that I would have gotten this positive test result based on all the negative tests that were conducted, um, the, the false negatives and the false positives? They're going to, to, to ask that question. So can I get the same result? Um, so if the hypothesis is correct, if I do have the disease, What's the chance that I would have observed this positive diagnosis uh, with, the, with the information that we have, which are these people that tested negative for the disease when they in fact had the disease, when they tested negative, when in fact they didn't have the disease, or when they tested positive, having had the disease, and when they tested positive, having not had the disease, right? So based on these results, what's the probability that I would have gotten this false positive or this false negative result? Um, 
So this is somewhat um, analogous to the p-value. Um, if you are familiar with that, in the sense that it is more natural to study the uncertainty of a yet unproven hypothesis than the uncertainty of data we have already observed, right? So it's um, so that's how frequentists would see this thing, right? They are going to say, um, based on the data that we have here, what are the probability or what's the probability that I would have gotten the same results or more extreme? So that's the, the testing hypothesis for the frequencies, right? Versus a Bayesian who, who would have said, based on the data uh, that you have collected priorly, what's the chance that I actually do have this disease, that I actually am testing positive, not a false positive or a false negative, that I'm actually having this disease. I hate that example because I keep thinking then about cancer and all kinds of diseases that you can test positive for, including COVID and all of that. So I hate this example. I'm gonna just skip it because then my mind is just ugh, filled with worry. Where's my mask? <laughs> you know? um, anyway, I hope that example was clear. But um, but then they start talking about um, in the book, right? That the fact that it's a balancing fact, uh, balancing act, and for frequencies, data is just that's that's it. That's how we get information. Whereas for Bayesians, is the balancing between the prior and the data, and then. Um, they start talking a little bit about the quick history lesson. Um, I'm, I don't want to go too much into it, except other than um, it's fascinating, you guys. I don't know if any of you have ever read about um, how Thomas Bayes started thinking about this. I think it was because he wanted to prove the existence of God, because he was a monk and in 18 something and he wanted to prove the existence of god so he started thinking about how to do so so he developed this uh, uh this framework right this bayesian um equation in order to do so but then he left it and started doing other things or i think he died i don't really remember and then someone else picked it up maybe it was like a former student of his, I think. I'm not, I don't really remember that part, but um, so this is Thomas Thomas Bayes, I think. So then uh, a previous student of his, I think, or someone that was close to him or a very close friend or something like that, sort of resuscitated that and said, oh my God, yeah, there's something here. We need to keep thinking about it. Let me just publish this and put this out into the world. And that's how we know about uh, the Bayesian equation and the Bayesian framework, right? Not because these monk Thomas Bayes, I don't know if he was a monk actually, if he was just a philosopher, I don't really remember. Maybe I'm just giving you false information here. We're gonna have to update our posterior here with new data. So I encourage you all to do so because the, the, I, I always forget it for some reason. I've read it many, many times, and for some reason I always forget it, but it's, um, it's really fascinating. Anyway, so now base, base, haha, no pun intended, based on all of the advances in computing, ex, um, especially in Python and R, we are able to actually estimate the posterior using these, I don't know if you've heard of this, but the, um, all of these algorithms, right? Especially the MCMC, um, uh, the MCMC chains. Oh my God. I always forget the Markov chain Monte Carlo, the MCMC. Um, and the, but there are others too, right? And um, so we can depart from tradition and start looking into this new way of analyzing data. We can. Um, Revaluation of subjectivity. I don't know why they put this here, actually. I don't, forgive me, I don't know what that's here. But the idea is that the more we are advancing with all these, um, all the new software and the, you know, computers are now able to 
analyze millions and millions and millions of data points. So then we are advancing. And there are so many packages too, because now we have Nimble, we also have Jugs, we have Stan, so many different software that we can use to, um, to create our, our, um, um, our Bayesian models, right? Which is, which is really fascinating and it's, um, and it's super cool, I think, because then we are able to formulate new questions or, or see the world in different ways by the, these different analysis, right? To be able to ask new questions. So that's it for chapter one. This is a very small chapter. Like I, like I mentioned, the other chapters, some of them are gonna be short and sweet like this one. Other ones are gonna be a bit more involved. So yeah, the idea is that we have 19 chapters to go through. So we're gonna be together for 19 weeks. You can skip a week if you, if you can't come, obviously I, I wanna see you, all of you, and maybe have more people join us um, in the future weeks. But like I said, we can communicate uh, in the Slack uh, channel for, for the, um, for the Bayesian, uh, for the, for this book club, for the base rules uh, channel um, in the in, in Slack. So what we're looking ahead are basically the book is divided into four big units. These 19 chapters are divided in these four units. First, the first five chapters are going to be the Bayesian foundations. Uh, we're going to focus on models and the distributions. Those distributions are key, right? To understand the priors and to understand the data. Um, then we're going to start doing uh, posterior simulations and analysis. That's three chapters. And we're going to focus on when to conjugate, uh, when conjugate is not an option, and how to use the MCNC uh, for the posterior analysis. The Markov chain Monte Carlo. Uh, the, the chains, right, to, to, to study this. Then the third um, unit is gonna be the Bayesian regression and classification. We're going to focus extending uh, unit one to when we have a response variable, when we have a Y with a predictor uh, variable, which is our X. So this is gonna be like a, um, like, like these linear models, like the basis of any, when we start studying statistics, right? We start with, logistic regressions or linear regressions. So we're gonna start that in, in chapter three, ANOVAs and all of that. Um, and then for the fourth unit, we're going to dive a little bit into hierarchical models, which I don't know if you guys have any experience with that. That means the model selection, right? The AIC, using AIC to, to select from our top models, that's GLMMs and all of that. And we're going to expand uh, this third unit to accommodate and harness grouped data. And, and that's basically it. So what I want you guys to do now is that, so we have like more or less 10 minutes to discuss anything that wasn't clear or if you have any questions or anything that you want to say, and then just select which chapters, you don't have to do that today, obviously. You can do it next week or the following week or this weekend or whatever, and then start thinking about which chapters you would like to lead. And bear in mind that you don't have to know anything and everything about that chapter. If there was a part that you didn't understand, you absolutely can say, so I read chapter, let's say we're going in chapter two, right? So I read chapter two, but this part, I didn't understand. Can you guys help me understand it? And then that's what the discussion is about, right? It shouldn't be like today where I did most of the talking. We can also help others understand that. So I'm gonna stop sharing now and then say that that's it. That's that's what I have for, for today. I don't know if you guys have any questions, comments or something that you guys wanna say. Anyone that would like to volunteer for chapter two? Thank you very much uh, for that very insightful presentation. 
So, but what I'm trying to get is that, is there any thin line between the frequencies approach and also the variation approach? Because that is what I was. So is there any thin line of demarcation between the frequencies and the variation approach? So I think it's, it's just more a way of seeing things through a different perspective. I think, I think that's, the, that's the key here. So let's say if I say, I'm hungry. I can either cook my meal, right? I can go to the kitchen and start chopping some vegetables and then cook for it. Or I can say, no, I'm just going to order something and call someone to bring me food. To So my question is, I'm hungry. What do I do to satiate my hunger? The approach, it can be either I cook or I order some food through, you know, have it delivered to my house. So I think it's more of that. You can reach the same conclusion or you can actually not necessarily reach the same conclusion, but it's just the way that you are answering the question is using different methods. One of them is going to be more involved. So the Bayesian one is going to be more involved, but it's going to allow you to answer certain things in a certain way that you wouldn't be able to with a frequentist approach. So it's not that one of them is, is, is right or wrong. A question can be answered using both of them. It's just a different approach or a way of answering questions. Does that answer your question? What do you work on? Uh, are you like a, um, so I'm an ecologist, what are you? I'm an agronomist. An agronomist, yeah. Okay, so that's very close to very close to what I do. All, all, yeah. yeah, you just you work with crops and stuff like that. I work with wildlife. Um, so yeah, it's it's exactly the same thing. So you can um, say if you're uh, if you're dealing with pests and pesticides, like yeah, what is the best approach to if your question is which pesticide is going to um, allow me to kill the pest, right? Which one is gonna be more effective? And you're comparing between three brands or something like that. You can collect your data and then get your results, which is what we usually do, right? And then boom, do an ANOVA or something like that. And then you have your results. Or you can say, well, I can do, I can build this whole model with a Bayesian analysis, right? Using prior information, which are gonna be distributions, I don't wanna to get too much into it, and some data that you collected and then try to understand um, how to answer that question. So it's just different ways of answering. What's the, um, with the frequentist analysis, I suppose you could say, um, if I kept doing this experiment over and over again, what's the probability of having this top pesticide actually helping me kill more pests the same way, right? Like if I re keep repeating the result, the, the experiment over and over again, what are the chances that I would get the same results over and over again? Whereas with a Bayesian analysis, you would say, well, I have the data and I have the prior information, the prior information that I know beforehand. And now, I want to say use combine those two and then say, okay, well, based on those th two things, the likelihood of me um, selecting this product as the top um, pesticide is 30% or 50% or 80% or whatever, right? So that's, that's somewhat how it's going. Um, I think it's, I think it's, it's, it's kind of like that, um, what this is. My idea and what I tell people is that, and what I tell myself is that know both, know enough about both to know when to use each one. I think that's the key. If you know a little bit about Bayesian, you know when you can, because, some, because it can get so intimidating. But if you know enough, you know that, ah, oh, well, yeah, I need to use it here because the, the question can be answered better through this um, approach. Whereas 
sometimes you'll say, no, a frequentist approach is gonna be enough because this is a very simple question that this is, that this is enough. So that's what I say, know a little bit about both so that so you know when to use each one, I suppose. I don't know if anyone wants to um, say anything else. I guess I would add that a lot of the time you can do the analysis a frequentist way and then do it the Bayesian way and a lot of times you'll get a really similar answer. Yeah, so I think sometimes it's more in like how you interpret the results. So like if in your frequentist analysis, you got like, oh, it's 89 uh, probability, 89% probability, then you would interpret that like, I always forget how to say it, the frequentist way. Like, yeah, if you would get, if you repeat it, if you would, if yeah. you were to repeat the same experiment over and over again, what are the chances yeah. of having the same results or more extreme ones? Exactly. Yeah. Yes, that. Um, but with Bayesian, it would just be like eighty-nine percent probability. Um, and it also is like you can update that information oh, yeah. if you keep collecting data. Maybe it's not going to be eighty-nine. Maybe now with the new data that you have collected. It's gone down to 80% or something. You mm. can do that, updating oh, yeah. information with the same model. It's pretty cool. I think also by when we keep going and then you're gonna start seeing the different, because we're gonna do like a linear regression, for example, but in a Bayesian framework, you'll see that um, we can have similar results, like you said, right? Than, than using a frequentist analysis. But it's like you said, the interpretation is different and the why we're using Bayesian is also key too, I think. We're gonna see that through the, through the I, just, I just don't wanna start talking about things that maybe you guys won't understand, like random effects or things like that, right? So let's just take it little by little um, each week, I think. Um, and yeah, so I think it's 3.58 for me. So we have two more minutes until, the Zoom, because I think the Zoom closes automatically. And if it doesn't, then I get in trouble if, for holding the Zoom because there, there could be other meetings afterwards using the same uh, Zoom channel or link or something like that, I don't know. So anyway, you guys, it's been a pleasure. So I hope to see you next week. Thanks, Gabby. Um, I just thought I'd let you know that like next week I'm I'm traveling, so I won't be able to attend. But uh, I'll just watch the YouTube uh, video afterwards. But yeah, I'll see okay. you in a couple. Yeah, sure. All right. Or I'll tune in. I don't know. Lucky. We'll see. <laughs> right. Okay. Thanks. Let's hope to see you then in a couple of weeks. Then. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Bye.